I'd like to greet all of our brothers, those that are connected with YouTube or the other platforms, the churches in Brazil and abroad, with the peace of the Lord. Our topic here is about the ministry, the call and rejection. What we'd like to talk about this afternoon what is the ministry for us? What is our experience of the ministry? The text that we're going to use here, Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we, on the days that the deacons were lifted up in the church in Jerusalem, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to ministry of the word. The word ministry appears here for the first time, giving a connotation that is special and different from anything else that exists. This expression, ministry of the word, it is a prophetic expression. Why is it prophetic? Because in the book of Revelation, when John has the vision of Jesus being glorified, when John saw him in Revelation 19, and he was clothed in a garment that was dipped in blood, and the name, he was called the Word of God. And from there, you can conclude that the word here is Jesus, who is the living Word. And when I say the ministry of the word, I am speaking of the ministry of Jesus. In the book of the, to, as speaking of the, the hand of the five ministries of the church, this is what God's work teaches us. So let's talk here about what is in the word of the ministry. What do we understand of the ministry? We have, we, we're not talking about what others think or what other religions or other denominations. We respect everyone. But when the Lord called us to this work, he brought us to have an understanding of what a biblical doctrine of, of ministry, not what we wanted to understand, because there is a difference, what you saw in the previous classes about reason and revelation. When the Lord called us to this work, one thing that called our attention was to go back to the Word, and the Word, the revealed Word, the living Word, and in this living Word, we understood the doctrine, which is easy to be understood. What doctrine is that? We have said this Previously, the doctrine is a combination of elements that come from the Word. The Word is the fount or the source of the doctrine through the operation of the Holy Spirit in the body. If you take the New Testament and you will find uh, segmented this as a perfect concept, the doctrine is a combination of elements that come from the Word through the operation of the Holy Spirit in the body. Therefore, the doctrine is not of reason. It's by revelation. The doctrine is characterized, characterizes the ministry that is linked and it not isn't the title. What does this mean? We're talking in God's word, the doctrine of the word. The ministry for us is not a title. It's not a title nor a profession. In, in no text, in, there is not in any area in the Bible where we see this a different way. There's no moment. If not, we would have to designate different functions in the Bible doesn't speak this way. The Bible shows 
what is the doctrine, what it shows in the word, is that the ministry is not a title. The ministry, what is it? It is a function. So doctrine, doctrine, it is a function. What function is this? It's a function that is executed through a context. What context is this? The body, the ministry is dis is developed in the body. That's why when you were called to the ministry, Paul says he spoke of the ministry in the book to the Corinthians chapter two verse uh, chapter three, we were called to be ministers of a new covenant. What is the new covenant? The, the body and the blood, the spirit and the body. What did Paul speak about the spirit and the body in, in the book of it to the Ephesians? He said, the Holy Spirit that works in the body, which are the ministries that we call the presbytery. And so doctrinally, what is in the Bible? What is the ministry? The ministry is an action of the Holy Spirit in the call so that you can have a function. Uh, it's, a function it's a function in the Bible. So doctrinally, what we see in the Bible, he is a call of the Holy Spirit to do a function in the body. That's why we repeat this in the book to the Ephesians. He says that we want to perfect the, the, the saints for the work, for the work of the ministry. It's a function. Okay. And when the Holy Spirit calls you, what is the recommendation that Paul gives to Timothy? Don't despise the gift that's in you that came what form? Came by prophecy through the laying on of hands of the presbytery. This is the body and the blood. It's the ministry of the new covenant. Let's go forward. I'll go back. What does this mean? The pastor all of his focus should be on the doctrine. The great concern of the pastor in this work is the doctrine. But, but salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, are these important? Yes, these are within a doctrine. Salvation is a doctrine through a teaching. How is salvation? You accept Jesus. How do you accept Jesus? How does this happen? You grow, you are developed, there is a process, there's an act, there's a process of salvation. All of this is doctrine. This is within that which the Lord called you, giving you the doctrine. Let's go. The zeal of the pastor should always be towards the doctrine. The authority to relay what was guided by the Holy Spirit is doctrine. The doctrine strengthens the body and preaching strengthens the preacher's vanity. What do I want to say with this? The Lord, he didn't call us to be preachers or great speakers. He didn't call us to be great preachers. But, but why? Look, if we look at the doctrine of the church, of the early church, at no moment did it make any exception it didn't, it, the church didn't show the, the ministry as a cultural or social position. We can see classic examples through the first apostles. They were very simple, but they also had Luke. They also had Paul who were very intelligent. And there wasn't this social discrimination or cultural. Look, the doctrine strengthens the body. Why does it strengthen the body? because it is an operation of the Holy Spirit, not individually, but in the body. And what does this signify? It doesn't depend on man himself. Preaching strengthens the vanity of the preacher. And man, when he goes into this area, he thinks he is the great preacher. 
And the, the history of the gospel shows this problem of some preachers when they isolated themselves. What the Lord showed in the early church, we're teaching about the doctrine of the early church. What did Paul say about this? When he wanted Paul to take over the government of the early church, he said, I want it to be the least. Why? Because he was a teacher. He was a teacher. We, the experiences that we have had throughout these years, what were they? We had great preachers in our midst, servants that God used. A classic example of this I want to give you, I always speak of this, was Pastor Jairo. I want to repeat a, a classic, a, a clear example that we had with Jairo in Portugal. There on Saturday, there would be a special service Saturday night, and we went to consult the Lord to see who would, would have the first message. And we consulted who would, we, we, we already, who would, who would do the praise. No one that was better was Jiroti. The church had invited members of, of pastors from the, the university, and there were a group of postdoctorate pa people there that would watch the service, and we had to put a preacher who had a, a certain culture, a certain uh, uh, ability to preach and knowledge. No one had doubt. It was Jiroti. We only had to have the person that would lead the praise. And when we consulted, the Lord showed that the Jairo would preach. And they had discernment. The Portuguese were scared. Who would, who's going to preach? No, it was Jairo. So what was the end? Jairo preached. Jairo T called him. Jairo, this is how it'll be. This is what you should do. The evening service, it was filled. All the university professors were there. In Jairo, he went in front. And in his simplicity, he was a baker. He wasn't very, he didn't have much schooling. He went to preach about the resurrection of Lazarus and he wrote the text. He talked about the stone that had to be solved and instead of removed, he used the wrong words. He preached about the stone that had to be solved and the pastors in front, they were in panic. And when he preached for 10 minutes, he asked them to stand. He asked everyone to come forward to accept Jesus. And they were all crying. And the Portuguese said, well, I don't know what this is. I don't know, they may have a stone that wasn't solved. And what happened there? What happened? Was it a preaching? No, it was an operation of the Holy Spirit. And we know that this work is not a work of great preachers. They are men that are used by God's grace. And this characterizes the ministry for us. I'm not talking about what's happening around, but in our midst, in our midst, The doctrine strengthens the body and preaching strengthens the vanity and, and strengthens sin by emotion. And these gestures, they are impressive. Those that are fleshly, they destroy what is spiritual. They annul the operation of the Holy Spirit. Let me share an experience, my experience. More than 20 years ago, we went to Brasilia and there was a meeting and I preached in the morning and everyone said it was the best message from the morning. It was mine. Everyone complimented me. I said, glory to God, but I, but I was certain to be a little prideful. Oh, praise God. I'm a deal. What a great message. Everyone just commenting about my message. And I was excited. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. But inside, I was starting to be a little, a little, a little vanity. I was vain. And v vanity is something that's very subtle. At night, I had a dream. And at the dream, in the dream, I was in a circus. And there was 10,000 people in the circus. And there was a presentation. I, a tra person in the trapeze, he was going to do a triple mortal to go to one to another. And everyone was watching. They were standing and applauding. And what happened when I saw who was on the trapeze? I was on the trapeze. And I said, what am I doing there? And I'm afraid of heights. And I looked down and it was huge height. And I started to, I was, I, I was the one that had to, uh, I couldn't even do a half of one. And I had to do three flips and, and land on the other side. And they didn't put the net below me. And I was, and I said, there's no way I'm going to do this. Everyone was waiting, applauding. He's going to, jump. He's going to jump. I'm not going to jump. 
and I saw there was a voice behind me, I'm going to throw you down. And I woke up and I understood that the word in this word is of the Holy Spirit and not of man. When you start to go into this way of being vain, you're going to fall and there's no more grace. And this is what we notice in the ministry. The doctrine strengthens the, the body and it, it's not individual. The gestures. Let's go to the next one. The pastor without the ministry doesn't have the body. We live in the body because we depend on the body. This is the doctrine. Read the book to the Ephesians chapter 4. Doctrine. The ministry has the government. We are government. We have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we can err. We can fail. But we are corrected in the body. This is perfecting in the body because we don't have, we don't have an academic way of being perfected. It's in the Holy Spirit. When I make an error and the Holy Spirit corrects me and I start to present a tendency and the Lord reveals and I fix it, it's very common. And the Lord showed in the beginning of this work that vanity will make many fall and many have fallen because of vanity. That's why we are careful. And when the Lord shows that we're being vain or very, very fat or, or your, your, your clothing like this, you have the Lord showing vanity. And if I don't correct this in my life, if I don't allow the Lord to correct me or listen to the Holy Spirit, because sometimes the Lord uses the sheep to show us this. The presbytery comes and, and moves and disciplines us because this is the government of the Holy Spirit. If there's no guidance, there's no government, there's no discipline, there's no gifts. People sometimes think that I am, I am this way because I have a spiritual gift. An isolated gift doesn't exist. Isolated gifts don't exist. A gift outside the body, it brings us to air. This is the doctrine. They don't have any testimony. They are dependent on their dependence. It's the ministry. They're dependent on others, their family members. I don't want to enter into those details. Let's go with the next one. One of the things that's, that's interesting and that's very serious for us. Look here, you, youth, do you know why? Because tomorrow, you could have, be, have a ministry in this work. You may have the ministry. No, in another way, you also could go out, go into a college, take a class, and have a, a license, and be a pastor that, are, that is licensed. You have a bachelor's. In, in theology, there's no problem. You, you have this right. But we are speaking of the ministry in this work, what the Holy Spirit has taught us. What did he teach us? He taught us that the ministry here has a characteristic that's very important. And I spoke of the body, and it's important for us to say that in the doctrine, because we're speaking of the ministry in the doctrine, when is it that you reject? When is it that you reject the ministry? Paul said to Timothy, don't reject, don't despise the gift that is in you that was given through, that wasn't by a diploma, wasn't by a license, it was by prophecy. And the ministry in your life is prophetic through the laying on of hands of the presbytery. When you kneel down, look at this. Look how interesting. I want to call your attention. The day that you kneel down the pulpit, you made a covenant. You made when the Holy Spirit, when the pastors went in front as the presbytery, when they said when the presbytery united, the Holy Spirit revealed when so-and-so would be lifted up to the ministry and you knelt before the pulpit. You made a vow, a vow in the body, the body of Christ of which the Holy Spirit called you to. And this is very serious. 
and you stood up and even an orientation of the Lord uh, there's a there's a letter that you wrote I'm not going to write this I'm not going to read it the Lord revealed and you vow and you renounce what you did when you knelt before the pulpit before the pastors with the operation of the Holy Spirit the ministry of angels and everything else your family was there and saw this and the Holy Spirit spoke to you at that moment about your anointing about your ordination and called you to a function. And when you stand up and later you say, I don't want this, you deny the vow. You don't have a ministry any longer. It's very clear. I'm not going to speak of a ministry. I'm going to repeat, not in the other religions. Everyone has their function. But in our midst, it's this way. You received it this way. The Bible says, Everything that is that is connected here is connected here, and everything disconnected in heaven is disconnected in heaven. When you leave this and deny this vow, you disobeyed your call. Why did you disobey it? Because you are self-sufficient. You're self-sufficient. I remember a brother in Villa Velha. He one day said to Jonas, he was very, very arrogant. He thought he was filled with Holy Spirit and gifts. Pastor Jonas, I'm not here to serve man. I'm not here, man with a with an iron hand holding me. I'm not here for this. I'm here to do and serve the Lord. And Jonas gave him a revelation. And I was close and I heard. So and so, the Lord showed that in this church, the greatest servant of man is me, is you. Ah, you're, you're joking because the Lord showed that the greatest servant, you are the greatest servant of yourself and you are the man. He is self-sufficient. Why? Because he had a good message. He had a good message. I did this in Brasilia and I almost fell from the trapeze. Self-sufficient. God doesn't need me. I am useful as long as I am faithful to my call. If I isolate myself and I start to talk about things behind, don't do this. If you say something isolated against the presbytery and you pay a high price for that. I remember one time I was in a meeting. We were a topic of pastors and when he left and went down the Lord gave a vision that the dove that was on the pulpit on our meeting and the dove it, it, it got scared had red eyes and the fire went out and the dove said I am going to hurt him it was a pastor that had left what is this what is this the Lord said he said something when he left and he hurt me and I went after him we said come back come back the, uh, pray with him. What happened? What did you say? Did you say something down there? The Holy Spirit gave us this revelation. He started to shake and he said, that revelation, he was a joke. And he said, don't do that. This work in ministry is very important. Don't, don't be too proud. I'm not going to enter into details. He didn't have zeal, without zeal of the doctrine. He was a preacher of nothing. Repeating the doctrine, we, want, we can repeat the message in the body an aimless message with no objective. Look at this. We think that we are a lot. We're important. But what the Lord shows is that we are men. We are limited. Profoundly limited. The experiences at the Manaim are so many that you can't imagine. The zeal for the doctrine is in the government and the direction to govern well. How do you govern well? Listening to the Holy Spirit. The government needs to be in the spirit. When you deal with deacons, they are brothers, they're servants, they have a work. And the deacon, he is responsible zealing for the doctrine as well. It's hard 
it's hard, but sometimes I have seen recently the pastor went to the deacon and said, I'm leaving. I am leaving. What is your position? And the deacon said, the Lord revealed that you are crazy. The deacon said to the pastor, the Lord revealed that you are crazy. My son had a dream this morning, crying, and he woke up. What was it? He told it to me. You are leaving, pastor. Okay, I'm not going to leave. The Lord showed that you are crazy. They are crazy, those that leave you. The ministry, the phrase, it's not mine, but I'm going to repeat it. The ministry is larger than our life. We need to understand that. Government of deacons, teachers, I'm not judging. I'm speaking. I always said this in the seminar. The Lord revealed to say it. I'm saying it. They're for me as well. They're for everyone. The pastors. We are servants, teachers, praise team, the government, praise team, a difficulty the pastor needs to work. The ladies, this is all the government of the church in the life. Why? Because the function of the ministry is to remain, continue steadfastly in the doctrine. It's not my doctrine. It's not the doctrine of Maranatha Christian Church. It's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's the doctrine that's inserted in the Bible in the New Testament. Some brothers, we receive letters, 1-800 numbers. They don't stop ringing. On, on Tuesday, we had to bring food to people that are working on 1-800 numbers, 24 hours, they're getting answers from around Brazil and around the world, around the world. Last week, there was a pastor, he heard, one of our pastors heard our program in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, he heard it. He was amazed and he, he got in contact with a pastor that, that from Brasilia, who speaks English and he talked to him, he was amazed with the doctrine. What is this? What doctrine is this? And he also said, the Lord revealed that you are in a great struggle, a great battle, but this is it. Purify yourselves in Ireland. This work is a mystery. It's a secret because it is prophetic. And they, and they remained in the doctrine of the apostles. It's not of A, B, or C, it's the doctrine that the Holy Spirit revealed and revealed to us by His grace and mercy. But, I'm going to conclude here. I want to share an experience that marked my life deeply. Those that are in, how, in your house and in, in watching this, listen to this experience. which will mark your life. It marked my life. And I think it will mark all of our lives as pastors, all of us that are pastors and have the ministry. I was a pastor of Pride da Costa Cuatro. The, we had over about 500, uh, 500 or so members. And in the church, there I was, and there was another pastor who helped me, servant of God, used by the Lord. And we were, there was a day of the, the supper. The church was filled. And this pastor, who was with me, he didn't like to give assistance to believers. He liked the new people. Those that were, were maybe possessed or had a problem, he called me. I, I'm, not, I'm scared of these. I don't like these things. The, the more oppressed they are, the less I like them. But he, he, I like, he didn't like the old believers. He didn't like to give attention to them. And we were there in the supper. And before we were going to distribute the elements, look at the experience and keep this, my youth. This will, if help, this will serve for your whole life. He started to cry. And I, I didn't see him cry that way. He, 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 cried a lot. And I said, is everything okay? And he said, yes. The, uh, they started to serve the elements. They started to be distributed. And he started to cry. So what's happening? 
he went and said, I'm having a vision. What's happening? The Lord, he is by my side. He, I, I can't look at him. There's a bright light, but he's by my side. And he's speaking to me the whole time. Look at what he heard from the Lord. The Lord said, look at my flock. He looked. Look, they are my sheep. And I said to him, yes, Lord, they're your sheep. And he said, they're not yours. They don't belong to you. They are mine. I gave you the privilege to shepherd them, but they are mine. My brothers, the sheep it belongs to the good shepherd that poured out his blood on the cross. He is the owner of your life. It's not me. It's not Gilberto. It's the Lord. We cannot make use of them. There is no authority in us of the Holy Spirit to do this to the sheep. You are not mine, the sheep. You are the sheep of the high shepherd. I didn't even need to say this. Because the Lord had already said this when he called Peter with all those difficulties. Do you remember? Do you remember Peter's difficulty at a certain day? Jesus was walking on the water and Peter asked to leave the boat to go to where Jesus was. He wanted to walk alone. And Jesus said, come, come, walk alone. He walked a little bit, a few steps, and then he started to go in, started to sink. And when he asked for help, the Lord said, you don't have faith. You are a man of little faith. Why? What happened? It was the faith was the direction of the Holy Spirit, the government of the Holy Spirit. The man leaves the boat, thinks he can walk alone to Jesus. He can do what Jesus did. He starts to sink. That's why the ministries, when they're alone, they sink and they end. And concluding, and the angels that didn't keep their order, but they left their habitation, they reserved the darkness in prisons, eternal prisons, at the judgment of that last day. And I conclude saying to you, if you want this ministry, it's good. If anyone wants the to be a pastor, it is something good. But remember one thing in this work, the ministry. It's not a title nor a profession. It is a function to be done in the body. If the Holy Spirit calls you and you make a vow, fulfill that vow because the Lord, it is before the Lord and you will be a minister when you are in this position. That's why when you leave this position, you will no longer be a minister, you nor have this function. It does not exist. I am. I am forever a pastor. If you renounce this vow, you are not a pastor any longer. Because in this work, the Lord called you this way, you are an ex-pastor. Oh, Amadeo is, he's, he's so hard, he is boastful. No, I'm talking about a doctrine, a doctrine. In the angels that didn't keep their ordination, they reserved the darkness in eternal prisons until the judgment of that great day. We are concluding this seminar for the youth. We'd like to thank the Lord for all that he has done this day. And we have a service tonight in our services. We are returning to having our services gradually because of the orientations of the authorities the technical aspects of the governments or the, the health organizations. And we are also not allowing our, our people in despair. Those that can't go to the presential services, you can participate in the online services as well. God will continue to do this great and marvelous work. May God bless us. Let's hear a praise. Then we're going to conclude.
speaking to the sun, I've come to take a redeem, that once I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, in the blood of Jesus God's Son. We want to praise you for this period, for your presence in this place. Praise you for a blessing on your youth, that you would be helping them to prosper and prosper their understanding of the doctrine. And we say in the grace of the name of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the Father, the eternal sweet consolations of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forever. Amen. Peace of the Lord. Our seminar is concluded. There is a, an interview with Pastor Zhidoti. We're going to continue on the air. A quick interview with Pastor Zhidoti. Praise the name of the Lord. We are getting to the end of another experience a blessing the seminar especially for the international seminar with the participation of the brothers in latin america north america europe other places that are participating live with us and some certainly the following week is translated into other languages for the participation of those in this seminar we've gotten to the end another day a day of blessing of the manaim which is wonderful. And we are here with Pastor Gerald Tigueros, 
who is going to bring us a word for you, the youth, uh, a conclusion of this seminar uh, experience lived here. It was a marvelous moment for us and for the youth. What is the word that remains for the brothers? In first place, I'd like to thank all of our brothers with the peace of the Lord, but I'd like to share that we are before many challenges. We've gotten to a moment where we have to have a divider of waters. We, with our what is in our reason, in our understanding, is that what's more, is it science that matters? Our reason matters? It has value in in one thing that is of man, in, in the work of creation, the great discoveries, the science. And sometimes when we speak of philosophy or anything else, people start to get aggressive. Philosopher, philosophy, we're not interested in that because we have to understand that the great philosophers and philosophy of the youth and any man, a man or a woman, there is a philosophy that is specific of minds that are very intelligent. You can have a great painting and you can encounter like a, a Van Gogh or Michelangelo. There are people that are able to have these abilities, these traits. They have this natural gift. And this is not expressed by faith, is not through natural talents. Man, by himself, he can't express the values of faith by human ability. This has to be understood. Therefore, our great concern is that in this moment, there are a group of people, 20, 30,000 of youth. And I imagine if these youth that are watching, they understood the message. What was the message? It was very simple. All of the message is one about science. We saw our brothers in the area of science, these researchers, more than 500 are part of the science and faith group. And we saw how it, the time was limited. And unfortunately, we know that the time is not ours. Therefore, we understood, Maranatha, in our church, our pastors understood that time is not no longer of man. It's not of our institution. The time is of those that are using it for what is necessary. There are their expositions and what they have to do. Therefore, we return all of our focus, all of our concern is, re is on the youth. Why? Because we are going to pass on uh, theologically, or uh, I'm going to go because I'm older, but we have to leave a legacy. But imagine there is a large group that are involved with many things. They don't, aren't able to produce faith. In this moment, you need a testimony. We cannot understand, and some brothers that are our pastors in the great majority, which is normal, they're going to understand about philosophy, but we have to understand the question, where is the difference between philosophy and life and death, where you're going to see about the creation and the creator? There is no way to confuse this. God created all things, and this it's by faith. And it is based in the experience with God. It's not the fact that you are contemplating. I, I believe in God because he is this. He made the sea. These are descriptions. These are beautiful. But this is not an experience of man with God. This is your reason. It's a testimony that's valid, but it doesn't bring you to eternity. What's important is for you to understand that you are in a project that God created in this life. And what Paul says, if we believe in God for just this life, we are the most miserable of all creation. What he's wanting that you believe in tomorrow, it's, it's, it's fine. We have to create something else. But 
if I rem if you you end how is the end of your life? But there are many things that we need to say. But we are concluding a seminar with much joy and happiness because we see that our youth they are firmed, they are positioned, they don't depend on those that think they know what is right or wrong. They understand this, and we are concerned with the youth because of this. Because it's with them, it's with you. I don't want to say, I don't want to compliment them, say that you, under, you are the best and the greatest in the world. No, what we're saying is for you to understand, and what we understand is that we need to have a group of youth that are valiant to create barriers within the church, outside the church, in the school, in their work. It's not to contest I, I don't say I don't believe in this. I don't I don't like this. No, your faith will be firmed on what is your experience with God. If you don't have an experience with God, you need one. You're going to be confused if you don't. Between reason and revelation, you're going to stay with the reason. That's what religion has done up to this point. Unfortunately, that's what's happened. It has become fluid and to be competing with the world. There's no way to take a teacher with his classes in philosophy and your position is that that's okay. Philosophy is something beautiful. It's great. Continue studying philosophy. There's no problem to be a teacher of philosophy. There's no problem. But you have to know philosophy is not a continuity of information. You don't have to believe what someone else says or accept what they say. That's how they get confused. Nitz, he spoke bad about Socrates. And the group, Aya, he didn't tolerate other theologians or other people that worked with metaphysics. And metaphysics is philosophical philosophy. So there are these contrasts that need to be removed. I'm, I'm giving an interview. I don't want to take the time of the brothers. You already understood everything. But look, from now on, you are responsible of the little that you learned. But I want you, I want to know what you learned. Put two or three phrases why is the gospel in the situation it is? Because I started to believe in the Bible, in the letter, and there's no way to combat this. If it's reason, there's no way to combat reason. If it's philosophy, philosophy is much more rational than the Bible. That's what's the problem. The Bible is a secret. It has a mystery. And the mystery, you can't understand it by reason. It only comes from the Lord. Thus, my beloved, it's a word of encouragement. We are together. We are, the God's work is prospering. Some are going to stay behind. You saw the message about Micah, the house of Micah. Some are going to stay in the house of Micah. They're looking for something that's new, and they have this. They are going to uh, build these things. In the youth, you need to show they, they were called to the ministry, and this is what's important. You need to be defined with the word with the revelation in your life, with an experience with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts and everything there. Thus, our embrace, and we are going to return as quick as possible with you again. May you pass this link to others of these topics to take, and we want to help you with any doubts. So no one would be our enemy. We don't want anyone to be an enemy. Continue. It's philosophy. Teacher, respect your professor of philosophy. Respect them. But... When they enter into your faith, then it's different. You have to argue with him. You have to have a defense. They're on one side, and they're they're speaking of of of, of a lemon. You're speaking of lemonade. It's different. It has this is a fruit. It's like this. But lemonade, you have to put water and sugar. It's something else. Lemons aren't lemonade. Peace of the Lord. Amen, Pastor Shulti. For you that participated in the seminar today and watch the seminar. Keep the blessing in your heart. Ask the Lord that he would continue to speak to your life so that what was reached here could be preserved in your life and in your mind. Thus, we are concluding this transmission and we want to say goodbye to everyone. Peace of the Lord.